My son's also on the autism spectrum. And so he processes things a little differently. And still at this age, and I, I wouldn't even think it's because of his, you know, his diagnosis. Because I, I would feel like most kids at this age, he, he does not understand hate. Like we talk about it and he, he's just like, well, I don't understand why people don't like somebody because of how they look. And I'm like, I don't Good for you kids. <laughs> We're insane. <laughs> Hey y'all, and welcome back to the Books We Should Have Read podcast. My name is Ashley, and I'm a writer and producer on a mission to get adults who typically aren't into reading into reading through the exploration of Black literary classics. This pod is an extension to the BWSR community, which is currently reading classics all about family and the ancestral realm. And you can find our complete book list for this collection at bookswishouldhavered.com. Tune in each episode as I discuss a classic from the reading list with a member of my tribe, from what we love to what we hate about it, but ultimately rave about why each book is, is a book we all must read. Today, we'll be talking about our third read in this collection, Transcendent Kingdom by Yagi Yazi, welcoming another new guest and friend to the pod, Amber. You may know her as Bookish Bohemian on Instagram, who is one of the dopest bookstagrammers on the platform. We're going to get into some really great truth-telling discussions surrounding motherhood, anti-racism, and anti-blackness in this episode. So if you're not at a part in your own personal journey where being truthful and honest is a non-negotiable, this probably isn't the episode for you. But that's okay. Take your time and come back when you're ready. Now let's let Amber introduce herself. Okay, well, I'm in Maryland, so the DMV area. I was a stay-at-home mom until recently, and I was turned back to work. So I'm a special educator, and I work with kindergartners. Oh, wow. I like that job, and I hope to kind of transition into, like, the middle grade. That's kind of more my expertise, because I used to mentor at a few middle schools when I was in college. So that's the goal. But um, outside of that, I just read and... I'm not, not that interesting. <laughs> you, no, stop it. You really are though. You are so cool. I don't even know how we started following each other, but like you, I just feel like a kindred spirit because I was just like, yo, nobody talks about like books the way that like I want to talk about books. Even like people in the bookstagram community, like it's very much so on the surface, but you were like, you were a real life educator. <laughs> that feels good to know because I'm like I, I'm long-winded and so I'm like people are not reading these captions and I'm like trying to share this information yeah <laughs> journaled about that about like the surface like I don't know I'm just feeling like if we are to amplify this diversity we need to get to the hard questions or why are we reading the books so I'm just going to keep on pushing, seeing <laughs> what happens. But it's good that you um, you kind of noticed that because I'm just feeling like we've been bamboozled for so long. So <laughs> let's kind of pull the scab back and really get to the root of stuff. Transcendent Kingdom, in a nutshell, is a beautiful story about a family's journey to figuring out where and how they, their culture, and their futures fit within their new home. The main character, Gifty, grows up in Birmingham, Alabama with her Ghanaian immigrant family, with each member on their own individual path to self-discovery. Her mother, also known as the Black Mamba, is a devout Christian and on a mission to make sure her children are well taken care of while under the watchful eye of the Lord. Her father, also known as the Chin Chin Man, reluctantly followed his wife and family to Alabama, but has a way harder time coping with the ways of the Southern United States. And her older brother, Nana, whose performance in the community sports warrants him instant celebrity status, has a tough fall from grace after an injury leads him into an opioid addiction. Being overworked, underpaid, missing home, and the loss of her son, Nana, then leads Gifty's mother, the Black Mamba, in and out of depressive episodes, leading this preteen turned neuroscience graduate student on a quest to uncovering the secret behind reward seeking behaviors. Mirrored with psychology research on why we humans do what we do, this story is told through Gifty's eyes and uncovers the effects addiction, depression, and religious violence has on their lives. Okay. I think this book 
to me was okay it, it was about you know the story of this immigrant family from Ghana and just how they were kind of navigating their new citizenship and a new like the new world that everyone aims to be placed in but I feel like that was sort of integrated into a main story of like the complexity of emotion and like a how can I word this? It's almost like because Gifty was on the outside looking in at two people that were struggling with different variants of addiction and mental health issues, but she was able to narrate it as if she was like in the thick of it with these people, even though it was their own personal intimate journeys. That's the best way I can describe it. <laughs> so and as someone, I um, actually, I have an anxiety disorder and a depressive disorder. So this kind of was very, I like spot on, like even like the racing of her thoughts. I'd mentioned in my post um, about the pacing and just how she kind of went, it's like a rabbit hole of thought processing through the whole book. And I was, it was interesting to read other people's reviews that they didn't really like the book. And so I read Homegoing last year and I purposely waited before I read this book because I didn't want to be like oh it's not like homegoing oh I thought it's gonna be like this so I appreciate it and so in ways I would say it's about mental health mm. and how that intersects with the immigration story what we perceive to be that transition and it, I think it, it was like really multi-layered I think she did a good job <laughs> yeah no I've yeah. That was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, you just summed it up like so beautifully. I will also say because I love drama, like I'm the girl like like Wild Seed. Have you read Wild Seed by Octavia yeah. Butler? Yeah. Like give me the dolphin babies, give me the demon spirits, yeah. give me all the drama and I'm hooked. But like this one didn't have too much of that, but it still felt like super scandalous because Black yeah. people, the diaspora in general, but also continental Africans I know are super prideful when it comes to like um, their personal like um, what it, issues, I guess you can kind of say. Like yeah. we're not the ones who are going to tell people in depth about what's happening in our household, right? Because it's our business. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just felt like wow like she's doing something so taboo but like so beautiful and it's just I don't know like I had so many feelings like I just felt like Gifty was like one of my friends and like I was like holding her hand as she was telling me her family's life story yeah yeah and I really enjoyed the relationship that she she had between the religion and science it's it was interesting to see it's uh very it was much hard <laughs> yeah yeah it was like a yeah those are like the questions I feel like most people have when they're trying to define their belief system separate from how they were raised or what's projected as the right way because everything just seems so black and white mm -hmm. oh yeah, I appreciated that because there is that demographic of people like, yeah, you might have been raised in a Christian home. I know I was raised in a Christian home, but I did not profess Christianity. <laughs> so it's like, I get it. And I, so that that struggle of balance and like like um, the reference of picking the petals off. I, well, I believe or I, I don't know if I believe like I, I understand that journey so much where you kind of you're raised to know like these values or these things, but then you get to a point where you're like, well, I need to figure out for myself. I don't want to have this belief system because it's what's known to be the thing to do traditionally and, you know, things of that nature. So I like the rawness of that because that's true. That's, that's something a lot of people live and experience. Like, that gifty the the character like straddled that line so perfectly in my head because um it wasn't either or for her it was very much so both and like she had qualms with both sides of the fence mm -hmm. um and I'm I'm speaking her qualms were mainly on the people on both sides I guess you can kind of say like her mm -hmm. belief 
in God or spirit was still very strong, even though she was reading a lot of these texts that like, um, or she was placed in a lot of environments where she was, she, if she spoke out about her religious beliefs or background, she would have been shamed for them. Yeah. And there was one instance where she was yeah. with a yeah. friend of hers. Um, but I just thought that that was just so like, I, I felt like that was just so strong of her. It was just so powerful that she still was very much so like, even though she wasn't like church going Bible right. thumper, she was still very much so like, nah, like I still believe in God. And I think that was a good way to display how like religion is great, but realistically it's more so about your personal relationship with whatever entity or energy you decide to have relationship with. And I think that's always been the struggle in society where, you know, you have to do like this external representation of your faith when it's really more so internal and it just may kind of be reflected in your interactions and your behaviors and things of that nature. So I like that in ways, it's like, was she ever, in ways she kind of felt like she lost her faith, but if you look at the general scope, like she, she didn't, she just learned to define religion and spiritual relationship by her own terms instead of just with her mom or like her church kind of reared her to view it as. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear Alabama? Well, it's racism for me, oh, and violence, both physically and psychologically, overt and covert. And in this family's case, religious too. Gifty's memories of her father, the Tension Man, are pieced together through the stories her older brother Nana shares with her. And that's because he left his family in Alabama and returned to Ghana when she was just a few years old. It's so easy to condemn this man's decision making, deeming him as a fuckboy, for lack of a better term, for abandoning his family. But though side-eyeing the entire fuck out of him, I can't help but extend him extra grace too. Leaving your home where your skin color didn't make you an immediate threat to your community and being immersed into a culture where race is literally everything has got to be ridiculously traumatizing. And there's one incident in particular involving the Chin Chin Man, Nana, and a young Gifty that makes this super clear. Ooh, girl, let's talk about that, like that church Alabama experience which was so like I've been using I I've been using the term uh violent way more often now than what I did in the past when I like would approach topics like this I would be way more passive in my delivery or like I wouldn't exactly call it exactly what it was am I making sense yeah, yeah. But now, like, I'm just like, oh, no, nah, that was violent AF. The day of this particular game had been hot and muggy. One of those quintessential Alabama summer days when the heat feels like a physical presence, a weight. Five minutes into the game and you could already see droplets of sweat flinging from the boys' hair every time they shook their heads. Southerners are, of course, accustomed to this kind of heat, but still it works on you to carry that weight around. Sometimes if you're not careful, it sinks you. One of the boys on the other team slid in a careless effort to score a goal. It didn't work. He lay there on the ground for a second or so, as if stunned. Get off of the damn ground, a man shouted. There were only a few bleachers at the soccer field because no one in Alabama really cared about soccer. It was a child sport, something to put your kids in until they were ready to play football. The man was on the other side of the bleachers, but that was still quite close. The game continued on. Nana was a forward and a good one. By halftime, he had already scored two goals. The other team had one. When the whistle blew, the boys came to join their coach on the bench, which was only a row in front of us. Nana grabbed a handful of grapes and carefully, methodically, started plucking them off the stem and popping them into his mouth while the coach talked. On the other side, the man who shouted grabbed his son by the root of his sweat-soaked hair. 
Don't you let them niggers win. Don't let them score another goal on you. You hear me? Everyone heard him. We'd only spent a little over half an hour in the company of this man, and yet it was already clear that he liked to be heard. I was too young to understand the word the man had used, but I was old enough to understand the change in atmosphere. Nana didn't move, nor did the Chin Chin man, but still everyone was staring at the three of us, the only black people on the field that day. Was them niggers simply a grammatical error, or was the plural supposed to include my father and me? What would we win? What was that man in danger of losing? Nana's coach cleared his throat and muttered some half-hearted words of encouragement in the attempt to distract everyone. The whistle blew and the boys from both teams rushed back into the field, but not Nana. He looked up toward the bleachers at the Chin Chin Man, who was sitting there with me on his lap. Nana's look was a question, and I couldn't see my father's face, but I soon knew how he answered. Nana ran onto the field, and for the rest of that half, he was a little more than a blur, moving not with the elegance my father associated with soccer, but with pure fury. A fury that would come to define and consume him. He scored goal after goal, even stealing the ball from his own teammates at certain points. No one checked him. The angry parent's rage was written in the bright red of his face, but even he didn't say anything else, though I'm sure his son paid the price for that rage in the car on the way home. By the end of the game, Nana was spent. His shirt was so drenched in sweat that it clung to his body, so tight you could see the outline of his ribs as he panted and panted. The tension man stood up as the referee blew the closing whistle. He brought his hands to his mouth and let out a loud, long cheer. He picked me up and danced me around the bleachers, our dance not elegant or precise, but messy, exuberant, loud. He kept cheering his cheer. Good job, good job, good job until Nana and Bears cracked a smile. The fury fled. Though the occasion for this moment was a somber one, the moment itself was joyful. Getting in a car that day, Nana and I were so happy, glowing in the warmth of our father's pride, delighted by Nana's accomplishments, looking at us then, two laughing, playful children and our warm, doting father. It would be easy to assume that we'd all but forgotten what the man had yelled that we forgot and we had any cares at all. But the memory lingered, the lesson I have never quite been able to shake, that I would always have something to prove and that nothing but blazing brilliance would be enough to prove it. such an intense moment and that question steps it stays with me like what will we win what was that man in danger of losing and that is the question of white supremacy what uh, and that's what i'm looking for in these books my my quest is i'm trying to figure out because historically anti-blackness did not always exist and so i'm just like what happened between this short hundred years of of a time period that all of a sudden stuff just flipped. And so I know that it points in the, uh, and I'm probably like getting off topic, but I know that it points in like the Spanish Inquisition. So I'm going to be talking about that soon on my platform because I'm like, no, we need to get to the bottom of this anti-black. Yes, please. Because <laughs> I, in, in real life, I have never, I have never read a text that talked about life before anti-blackness. Mm-hmm never yeah Yeah. and I'm just like it's there and I feel like that needs to be known or we're always going to have this sad and I know the bulk of our history is traumatic that's reality but there's also like so much beauty like of course in our trauma but we've had so many contributions globally that no one knows about and I'm like we need to kind of acknowledge that or we're always going to not know where to start in this whole combat against the system we need more of that because like Mm -hmm. i just i just think i just even thinking about today's events you know most recent events which is just so like traumatic i'm i'm getting so desensitized to it because white people have been terrorizing the globe Mm -hmm. for centuries and it's just like, when are y'all going to do something about y'all? 
Yeah, and you know, my staycation is part of that. I've been on social media for a couple of days because it's been a triggering space and I don't know the place to have these feelings right now. <laughs> so I just needed to come somewhere and write. It's a hard space to balance because there's a, supremacy is so layered and I'm just mm -hmm. one of those people that kind of wants to look at all the layers I, that's just how I am. And so my biggest struggle is anti-Blackness and it's severely dismissed and that's triggering for me. I, that's just the, the idea of activism and supremacy has just been like a heart thing for me since like middle school. So like this notion that we're supposed to spearhead the movement and be the face we've always been the face for the, a movement that has not loved us back and we have i don't know how real i could get on this you could get very real are you kidding me you could say i just feel like we continue to be champions to have the backs of communities that have never historically had our back and i struggle with that i like near tears in the past couple of weeks because it's just like I feel this way because I'm like in just point blank but I know this history and I feel like there's this energy of oh no we're not talking about that right now we're just getting together and we're just fighting supremacy I'm like well how can you fight supremacy without looking at anti-blackness anti-racism to me is internal before it's external how are you perpetuating the system that you're trying to demolish. I even look at my own inherent biases because I want to be anti-racist. And I feel like there's this level of hypocrisy and like surface level like activism and allyship. And I guess I'm just more of a realist. It's like I I don't I don't bang with injustice, but we're never going to truly be a collective of allies until we get anti-blackness out of our communities and we can't just say oh that's because of white supremacy yes but we're perpetuating it because i know that i've also had a lot of incidents where it wasn't a white person that said some stuff to me so or did some stuff to me so it's just like we have to look at that and so it has been a struggle seeing and it's been blatant it's been blatant on social media i've watched the blatancy <laughs> of it and it has I was like, I need to remove myself. So the centering that needs to happen takes place. And I need to feel the validity of my feelings as a black woman, mm -hmm. history and like the betrayals back and forth that have never been resolved. And I just need to come back at a later time. <laughs> oh, you you said that my, my biggest thing is like, just tell the truth. Why yeah. can't y'all just tell the truth? Yeah. like. <laughs> A black person told me my hair was nappy before any white person did. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just, I'm just saying. Like, a a black person told me that that light skin was better than dark skin before any white person did. Yeah. Like, are deep. you? Yeah, it's deep, and no, I think I feel like it's uncomfortable to talk about and I feel like in under the white gaze that's why the communities don't want to talk about it and I know the thought process if we amplify our trans our inner transgressions it's going to be a loophole of deflection for white people yep and then they'll feel like their actions are justified America has a lot of transgressions and I don't like to say sins because that's like such a Religious, for like a religious related word, but I feel like there is a shift where America has highlighted the issues of everyone around them, and now they're under the microscope and they're not going to be able to weasel their way out of it. And not that I want to like guess on future trauma, but the reality is just while there were these murders happening, there were murders happening. We're dying every day. We're dying hey, every day. Say that. <laughs> say that. So this is like there has to be, there's gonna be a space where I, I would not put it past the shift that I feel that we're in for each community and the transgressions held against each community start to become amplified. 
because we're now in a space where people can't decide that they don't see it on TV. They can't decide that, oh, I didn't know that. Like you, you knew, you didn't want to know. You decided to be com comfortable in your complicit choice. So yeah, I just feel like this is not the end of a lot of stuff that's going to happen. That's just how I feel because I just feel like things are going to shift. I don't think that supremacy is going to be like demolished tomorrow, but I feel like more authentic strides will eventually be made. Mm. But I, there is this gay, this like, this like rose colored, and it's not, it's not bookstagram per, per se, because even people who don't, who aren't in the community, a lot of people think that they're going out and they're buying these books and I'm anti-racist now but like no you're not because you read a couple books <laughs> I hate to say it that way but that's just how it is no I don't even call myself anti-racist I always say I'm working to become anti-racist because I have my own we all have our own stuff yeah and I feel like for me to be true to myself I don't want to just be like yeah yeah I'm just all I just feel like it's 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 beyond the books. And I'm just like, we need to get to like, why can't we have like these conversations that really make us look at ourselves so we can truly see each other because we all have so much more in common than we think. <laughs> and Absolutely. If we any up and buck the system, it could be successful, but it's right now it's like surface deep work. Sorry for rambling. But no, no, that's <laughs> that's perfect. I'll just kudos to you for um, wanting to delve deeper into this because when I tell you the moment I dropped out of grad school I just gave up like I was just like yo it's it's me now like I'm doing the self-work on me so that I can like um show up as myself without having to um, diminish someone else's presence in order to make myself feel good like I feel like that is my starting point right mm -hmm. like um and so like I've I've given up on like the fight for equity and equality like I, like making that my main uh, how should I say this I haven't given up but I've given up right like I don't I don't go to protests I don't go marches like I don't watch trauma porn not mm -hmm. here for it um I read a lot these days for the past like year and a half I've been dedicating a lot of like my book space to fiction like I'm all about creating these futuristic worlds um where we do see black people in the future because that that's what gives me hope um mm -hmm. and like I just I genuinely feel like um <clears throat> dismantling white supremacy is not my business because mm -hmm. I didn't create it. And there are things within our community where we still uphold it, right? And so yeah. those are the things that I'm going to work on for myself. But in yeah. terms of trying to get someone else to admit that they have biases and that um, they have, that they are racist, like, I don't, I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm just like, okay. Like these, I'm so like desensitized to other people's bullshit that like, mainly because like I just don't want your trauma porn and if I want to learn about history I'm going to do it on my own terms instead of like listening to you tell me from your perspective because I feel like I'm not getting the whole truth when I listen to you but yeah. like when I'm out there doing the research myself mm -hmm. analyzing the data myself like mm -hmm. I'm more I'm going to get more of the truth I don't know if this is making sense girl but yeah. I'm just like yeah that's why I'm in nonfiction and historical fiction are my favorite genres and then well it's a it's a tie with poetry because poetry is how I got into reading and writing but and then fantasy and it's for me my nonfiction reading kind of relates to like the skin positivity for my children it's like we can love ourselves, but for me, it's like, I need to know who, like, where did we come from? Like, I need to know that stuff so I can cherish it. Like, we won't have anything to cherish to pass down if we don't 
accumulate that information. And so I balance and I've gotten better with fiction because some of my reads, but well, most of them are like heavy and dense. <laughs> so I'm like, I need to balance. In this next clip, Amber and I get into the family's Pentecostal church and how violently hypocritical it was. And of course, how racist it was too. Even in the house of the Lord, with white Jesus at the helm, black people still weren't shit. Covertly, you know, because you can't be a good Christian and call those people niggers, at least not to their face. Gifty's family stuck out like a sore thumb already because of first their race and second because their Ghanaian heritage. And when Nana's heroin addiction became the talk of the town, they cemented their position as the church's spectacles. Gifty and Nana were well aware of their social status within the church, but their mother, the Black Mamba, didn't let the way those white folks saw her stop her from praising God within those four walls. And she did so unapologetically, every single Sunday, dragging her family, kicking and screaming alongside her. I think what struck, and I guess when I first read the story, initially I was kind of lost on like the race demographic of the church. It wasn't until later on when she overheard like the two ladies talking about the addiction. And I was like, oh, so they're like. Oh, wow. You didn't pick up that like they were the only black family. And I I was like, maybe. But I was like, (laughs) I guess because he was so you know, probably sounds bad <laughs> because he was so receptive to like helping in that state. I've been in Alabama. I know how Alabama is. So I guess I was, I didn't have the expectation of him operating, I guess, in his faith over like, I guess the microaggressions that apparently reside in that church. So yeah. And I guess it, it, it reminded me of like British colonialism. <laughs> in Africa, where, you know, of all the churches to go to, you know, that's the one she comes across. And I just, I struggled with that, like, undertone, not that I think it was intentional, but it, it's it's reality, that undertone of, like, the white man being this proponent of giving God's word and, like, running God's church and his people and just having this undeniable trust in that type of dynamic. So that was something that kind of struck a chord with me because, I mean, me and my husband were just talking about this, about how, you know, historically, religion is uh, very deep-rooted with racism. So (laughs) it was just very interesting to see that play out and just, it's like, they ha- there was this support for the mom with her issues, but then like just complete denial for the children. And so I was just tr- kind of lost on like, what was the de- determining factor of where they prioritize one over the other. And so I guess it also just kind of sh- showed the humanity that is in the church that people try to act like it doesn't exist. We're okay, yeah, we go to church and we may do all of these things to kind of project our faith. But at the end of the day, we are humans too that judge, that chastise, that mm-hmm. go completely against all the things we go sit in this building and do on Sunday. So it, mm-hmm. it, I, it kind of exposed like the hypocrisy that honestly is in a lot of churches that no one talks about because the sin of who the sin of whoever is is bringing the current shame of the church that takes the precedence over all the like minute trivial sins that are happening regardless of who's pregnant or who's addicted to drugs Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah so yeah I would yeah you you touched on so many things um one being of course growing up in the church people think that just because you're in this the house of the Lord that that like you're you're not sinful at all like you're perfect now you're all of a sudden put on a pedestal you're better than everyone else who's not in the church Mm -hmm. and then there's a hierarchy in there too it's a lot of classism um I've firsthand like um different families treated differently because of how they dress or how much money they have how much they're able to tithe you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's all a bit, like, 
of a mind fuck, excuse my French, but like seriously, like it can take a toll on you. And especially if you are, okay. So especially if you are um, fully like, if especially if you fully immerse yourself in that culture, like emotionally, um, re- like with your relationships, if that is like your end all be all, then like you will be fucked up. Um, what I appreciated about Gifty's mom though, was that Gifty didn't really talk too much about her relationship, her mom's relationships with people in the church other than the pastor. Mm-hmm. And so in my mind, Gifty's mom was more so like, I'm not here for y'all. I'm here for God, period. And yeah. so I'm gonna sit and when her son died and she was a little bit, you know, she was shouting a little bit more and she was out there dancing crazy and stuff. It felt like that's when I really like settled in with the fact with the thought that, like, oh, she's just she's literally here to praise the Lord. She don't care about nothing else. And whereas Gifty. And Nana may have been a little bit more perceptive. Is would perceptive be the right word? I guess their their eyes were, they noticed a lot of the environment. Their focus was more so on the environment and how people are hypocritical here and how, oh, the pastor's message changed about um, the, the pastor was way less like condemning when his, daughter got pregnant in the church and now God's word is all about forgiveness right like that was something that Gifty picked up on but the mom to me like she really approached it more as like um we're all human Mm -hmm. ain't nobody here better than anybody and Mm -hmm. I'm here to praise God yeah yeah. and so I respected that so much but still Mm -hmm. like in the midst of this like even the dad, the Chin Chin Man, <laughs> um, him like being so like feeling so attacked and unsafe being in that town, yeah. like he didn't have his blinders on with like the mom did. Like the mom came to America with a mission. Yeah. Yeah. She was there for a purpose, and that's it. None mm-hmm. of this other stuff matters. I'm gonna make my money, I'm gonna go to church, and I'm gonna raise my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, she wasn't worried about fighting racism. And a part of me is just like, I feel her. But on the other hand, it's like, why were you so okay? Like, was your life in Ghana that bad to where you just felt like you didn't have to challenge the American system? The Chinchin Man and the Black Mamba dealt with the racist American system differently, but that's because they carry contrasting definitions of better with them. For the Black Mamba, better seemingly was job security and the American dream for her children. And for the Chinchin Man, better meant respect, decency, and community. While living in America, Nana and Gifty, not by their own volition, but rather at the whim of their parents, and ultimately the Black Mamba, took the brunt of the violence that comes with being Black and African in the American South. But when I was um, talking about Kindred with one of my friends, I talked about um, an incident in elementary school where (laughs) our teacher divided the classroom up into slaves and slaveholders. <laughs> so I, I, I guess on page 25 of this, I'm not sure which book you had. Did you have the physical or you had the... Yeah, the yeah same, same, same. Um, Gifty recalls her first experience. I don't... Uh, knowing when... In my head, this is her first experience with knowing that there was a a stark contrast between like black people and white people. And she, um, well, too, also in kindergarten, she was very cognizant of the fact that being African in America wasn't lit during that time. And so like she would make up stories about like her being a princess and all this stuff in Africa or Ghana more specifically. Um, (laughs) And one of her white classmates says, black people can't be princesses Mm, yeah and that like made me think about my first experience knowing that like I was black (laughs) 
by the time I wanted to hear the complete story of why my parents immigrated to America, it was no longer a story my mother wanted to tell. The version I got, that my mother had wanted to give Nana the world, that the Chin Chin man had reluctantly agreed, never felt sufficient to me. Like many Americans, I knew very little about the rest of the world. I had spent years spinning elaborate lies to classmates about how my grandfather was a warrior, a lion tamer, a high chief. I'm actually a princess, I said to Joffrey, a fellow student in my kindergarten class whose nose was always running. Joffrey and I sat at a table by ourselves in the very back of the classroom. I always suspected that my teacher had put me there as some kind of punishment, like she had seated me there so that I would have to look at the slug of snot on Joffrey's philtrum and feel even more acutely that I didn't belong. I resented all of this, and I did my best to torture Joffrey. No, you're not, Joffrey said. Black people can't be princesses. I went home and asked my mother if this was true, and she told me to keep quiet and stop bothering her with questions. It's what she said any time I asked her for stories, and back then, all I ever did was ask her for stories. I wanted her stories about her life in Ghana with my father to be filled with all the kings and queens and curses that might explain why my father wasn't around, in terms far grander and more elegant than the simple story I knew. And if our story couldn't be a fairy tale, then I was willing to accept a tale like the kind I saw on television, back when the only image I ever saw of Africa were those of people stricken by warfare and famine. But there was no war in my mother's stories. And if there was hunger, it was of a different kind. The simple hunger of those who had been fed one thing but wanted another. A simple hunger impossible to satisfy. I had a hunger too. And the stories my mother filled me with were never exotic enough, never desperate enough, never enough to provide me with the ammunition I felt I needed in order to battle Geoffrey, his slug of snot, my kindergarten teacher, and the seat in the very back. Did you, were you told that you were black by black people or by white people? By white people. I was called the N-word for the first time when I was four. Yeah. And my mom went to the school and was like, it's either you do something or I do something. So you were called the yeah. N-word. And so I came home and I was like, what, what is that? And she was just like, <laughs> by a student yeah yep a four-year-old baby called another four-year-old baby the n-word my mom to this day the anger comes back when she retells that story Ooh. that yeah yeah so, and recollection of it than i do i have like you know how when you're i guess our age you have like those flashes of memories it's kind of like a flash for me but she remembers the day like it happened yesterday where was so, yeah. this mm -hmm. where was this i was still yeah we've lived in i was born in germany but i've been here since i was five so and we've been since i was five wow so, so that that happened in germany it happened within a year of me first coming here so i you know because i came here when i was five and then i started school that fall and it happened that first school year what the yeah. heck, yo? And so, okay, you as a mother now with that experience in your like tool belt of memories in mm -hmm. action, um, have you talked to your boys about it? And if so, how did you do it? From birth. So what I've done since I, ex I dabbled in what I guess people will call the woke community. And I found out that there were just certain parts that I may just not relate to, but it, that started my studies of like our history before slavery. And so since then, I've kind of just been a student of Black history, not just U.S. history, but just global Black history. And so since, since I became a parent, I've just been collecting all these books. Like a lot of these books I read and share, they're books I'm saving to share with my kids because I'm like, I need to absorb this information because they're not going to get it in school and I need them to get it. I'm, I, I was just telling my sister this yesterday. I like 
on an emotional level, like grew up feeling robbed by the school system because I went to a high school where we were 4% of the population. And I was mm. all the one black kid in the AP classes who people stared at when we we're talking about civil rights. Like all that, I, I used to ask for bathroom passes and I would stand in the hallway while they were like watching the sit-in videos. Cause it was just like very uncomfortable to have people looking at me waiting for like some reaction. <laughs> so and I was just, and I like purposely wrote every history paper I could on stuff that wasn't in, in books. So like, like Amistad, why is that not in there? That's like a successful slave rebellion. There was like one sentence about that, like with the, the, the name of the shipment. I still remember that. <laughs> so um, I've just started with representation. And so we have a lot of black art in our house. We have like, of course, we, well, I'm a, of course a big proponent of reading in books. So they have a library, but then I have what we call our representation library, where it's mm -hmm. just specifically black authors and authors of color. So we were building that library and I've always talked since we kind of got on like actual verbal conversations about race when my oldest was two. That's when he started daycare and he had came home one day crying about why he wasn't green. That's his favorite color. And so I was like, you know, you know, you have this beautiful brown skin. Ask him, well, why do I have brown skin? And so that's how it started. And so just letting them, my, my main goal is for them to first, before we get to the, like the detail of race, because we're just now starting that with the nine-year-old over this past like year and a half, mm -hmm. start with skin positivity. I, how you look is, is how you're supposed to look. We all are beautiful people in the sight of whoever, even each other's eyes and I just feel like if it doesn't start with self, if that is not, if that foundation is not in children from home, they'll go out and let anyone tell them who they are. Yeah. Who they are. So I just want them to have a sense of self before they go out into the world. And so that's what we talk about. You know, we we spend a lot of time on Africa. I also like my my um, son is in school and I pre-read text for a homeschool curriculum called Woke Home, Woke Home School. And it um, chronicalizes pre from pre-colonial Americas until like present day, but it's complete U.S. history solely from the perspective of Black and people of color. Wow. So, like the texts are very vetted. Like you're not going to get a book on Black history by a white guy. Like it's from the actual. It's from Thank the goodness. Actual. Yeah. And so that's just how I'm trying to, I guess, fill in where I know the system and like schools will fail him. And I would do that with the rest of my kids. So that's just what I've been doing. Any opportunity of visiting places, of course, that kind of got warped. We felt like he's at the age now to kind of visit the, we'll have a first visit of the African American Museum. So once things become more safe, we're going to mm -hmm. go there. Yeah, I, I mainly just start with like picture books. And so like my two-year-old's favorite book right now is Chocolate Me by Tay Diggs. Oh, wow. That's so cute. He loves her skin because of that book. Her skin for it. <laughs> so. That's so beautiful. Being Black in white spaces is something that Amber, myself, our main character Gifty, and the author Yad Yazi can all relate to too well. And while Amber and I appreciated the cerebral retelling of Gifty's family's experience and her relationship with religion and science, there are quite a few others who weren't here for Gifty's apparent lack of sense of self and the slight ambiguousness left in character arcs. What do you think about undone characters and storylines that aren't neatly packaged by the time you close the book cover? We'll love to hear what you think. Okay, now back to the episode. I, I still, I don't see how people could not like Gifty. I, and that's just, I yeah. just felt like she, she isn't perfect. She's learning everything. Like mm. to me, like she approached so many topics with so much grace. Like mm. she, what did they want? I guess from some of the reviews that you read, what did they want from her? I read that people grew tired of her lack of sense of self and she was just so hopeless and her story was just so sad and they didn't get backgrounds of the other characters but in, from my perspective 
I got a lot from all the characters. And yeah. some this is something that I think, and I wonder that maybe I'm a I'm a reader that doesn't mind or I actually like having to read between the lines. And I think sometimes books that cause you to not be able to read and be like, oh, the cat ran down the street. Like the it's shirt not, was blue. <laughs> right. It's gonna be like that. Sometimes the beauty or the extra jewel, the extra jewels are in between clean the lines that the author intentionally leaves there for you to sift through, but you'll overlook them and assume it's a bad story. Mm-hmm. And that's how you choose to kind of interact with the story. And everyone reads their own way. But from what I was reading from the reviews, they felt like this was, they thought that the book was poorly written compared to Homegoing. And I'm like, it's not the same type of book. I didn't read Homegoing, but, but I'm going to. Oh, okay. I would love to see your thoughts after you read that a lot of the negative reviews I saw is because people went into this book with an expectation that they developed from reading Homegoing wow and something that I've also as someone who's read Luster and Queenie I saw similar reviews about those characters as I have with Gifty and so then it brings me to this point or like not this point but this thought of Is there like a resistance to characters that come undone in rawness? Because Mm -hmm. I read Queenie, I I was like, yeah, my my, I was like, okay, they're talking about her going to therapy. I've never read a book like this, but they're like they're like talking about therapy and all this type of stuff. And yes, she was reckless, but I was like, what twenty year old girl (laughs) wasn't? So it's like, have we gotten so far in our own growth? That we can't read a character that reminds us of way back when and we can't give them the same grace that we either got or wish we had gotten in our own lives. And I just noticed the 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 connectivity between that, where it seems like the characters that have this journey of self and like especially older characters, a lot of readers have this expectation like they should have like gone through all this already like why is she still having these battles and I'm just like for me these are the real characters I you know to see that inconsistency in thought and in belief and one thought triggering another I love seeing how she was so cerebral about emotion and she Mm -hmm. read it to this mice experiment and I so much like oh like the science is great but I don't understand why she kept going back and forth and it took me till halfway through the book where I was like she has been searching for the answers of her brother and mother's addiction through these mice and yes it's like she is getting a second chance of trying to rectify she saw herself and her mother and her brother and specifically that that um mouse with the limp because in certain ways each of them was on like this reward system seeking yeah yeah she was seeking identity separate from her brother she was seeking the love and attention from her her mom Mm -hmm. mother was seeking the love and attention from excuse me chin chin man and also I can't even really explain into words the depth of the gravity she felt for I guess in certain ways blaming herself Mm. for the that happened but there was like you know that seeking behavior in all three of them and I think their life was so traumatic that she was like okay the emotion part was never our thing so maybe if I find out neurologically why this is happening and I thought that was such a very interesting way to kind of go into it because then anyone who's reading this book also kind of got like some lessons on psychology (laughs) and I I felt so much smarter after reading this (laughs) yeah Um, no, you're so right. You're so right. That like, to your point about like people reading it and expecting a character who had it all together, that it reminds me of like me and my friends graduated university in 2011 and like 2015 or 16, our old asses went to like a college party from so like the freshmen who were freshmen when we were seniors we knew them through our networks and so those freshmen back then at that time were now seniors mm-hmm. having parties 
with other freshmen there and we're the old ones coming to the now seniors party and I remember I was just so annoyed being there and I was like oh why are they acting like this oh my god like it's alcohol like chill and then my friend was just like Ashley what were you doing when you were that age you <laughs> were you not out here right. wilding out yourself mm, right like mm -hmm. and it's just like expecting people to be where we are is like so selfish yeah 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 and that's what we were talking about so i'm gonna make a mental note about race i need to <laughs> thank you for schooling me well, yeah. <laughs> you schooled me so much are you kidding me this would be the final thing why do you think this book is a book that people must read I think this is a book that people must read because it gives a very intimate lens of mental health, not only in general, but from the perspective, from the Black perspective and layers of the immigrant perspective. And that in itself could transform how a reader of this book would look at those specific themes of conversation. It, I know for me, even with all that I've learned, I learned a lot. I've, even as someone who deals with like mental health issues, it was very different to kind of see it play out, to see, it was, it, it was very beautifully written where anyone could read this and in some variant, they could relate somewhere in there, maybe not hit all of the dots but at least some of them and so it, it's very I feel like mental health is not brought up in a lot of fiction at least the fiction I've read I'm, I'm it's like becoming more common now mm -hmm. but you know I just feel like it brings that conversation to the table I like that it brings up the you know that compare comparison and contrast between religion and science Ooh. there's there's so much meat there that someone could that part of the book is a is 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 worthy of religious conversation and secular conversation that could be dissected in a church and outside or outside of a church and still bring forth like some really good conversation so i think those were some really key points in why this should be read and also just kind of looking at like the psychology the, for, for anyone who's like a cerebral reader they would like the psychology aspect of it and then just how the imagery of how she she painted i, I wrote it down the human trait of curiosity is linked to addiction mm. and exploration is the exercising of curiosity and recklessness and that's basically what this book was about a real like diving into how does addiction come to be addiction is not just drugs addiction is to love to visibility to all of these things you know to feeling that you need to be validated by the people that you live with like everything it, it's yeah I, this is something i feel like high school students should read mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. I would also say, like, to your point about relatability, like, I've never been clinically diagnosed, um, but I can tell you honestly, truly, that I understood why her mother couldn't get out of bed. Yep, I understood by the end of the first chapter, because I was like that recently. So I know how it is to want to get up, and you can't, and you feel stuck because your leg won't move like mm. you know it's it's a tough space to be in and then when you relate it to like the crazy undertone of some of the text and just how ridiculed and ostracized mental health and mental illness is especially in our community because mm -hmm. it's a spoken thing in my family depression doesn't exist mm -hmm. only until now are people starting to be more receptive to like the talk of mental health and so mm -hmm. it really elevates these themes that allow 
readers in general to kind of touch on the uncomfortability but necessity of these themes, but also especially Black readers who sometimes don't get the revelation of, oh, it's okay to talk about this until they read it in a book like this. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. You can follow Amber at Bookish Bohemian on Instagram if you don't already. Follow Books We Should Have Read on Instagram at Books We Should Have Read to stay up to date with the latest BWSR happenings. This podcast was produced and edited by me, Ashley Reynolds, with additional sound effects and mixing by Soundwave. The dope ass track you hear in the background was produced by Ty.2 Wo. That's T Y dot the number two and the letters W O on Instagram. If you liked what you heard and want to support this black woman owned and operated movement financially, there is an anchor link in the show notes where you can do just that. Any and everything is welcomed and appreciated. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Bye, y'all.